Hello, everyone. I'm Heather Moran, and I'm the CEO here at Sixth and I. And whether you're here with us in person or watching virtually from home, on behalf of Sixth and I and our partner, Politics and Prose, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and for continuing to support nonprofits and independent bookstores. Now, by show of hands, many of you look familiar, but how many, are you, how many of you are here for the very first time? Oh, welcome. It is so nice to have you, and I would love to share a little bit about this beautiful space. The building dates back to 1908. It was a synagogue for 45 years, and then home to an African Methodist Episcopal Church for the next 50. When the church relocated and put the building up for sale in the early 2000s, the highest bid was from someone who wanted to turn it into a nightclub. <laughs> Within 24 hours, three local real estate developers with a new vision for cultural and Jewish life in DC saved the building. And now, for the past 18 years, Sixth and I has served as a center for arts, entertainment, ideas, and Jewish life. Our aim is to inspire more meaningful and fulfilling lives through an unexpected mix of experiences that embrace the multifaceted identities of those we serve. It is so exciting to have Congresswoman Katie Porter with us tonight. Now, while she represents Orange County, California in Congress, she represents frankness, integrity, decency, and commitment for our entire country. Since the time she defied expectations in 2018 when she was elected in a historically conservative county and became the first single mom of young kids to serve in Congress, Representative Porter has distinguished her public service by leading with her values and her no-nonsense approach. Using a whiteboard to unflinchingly take CEOs and government officials to tasks in congressional hearings, Congresswoman Porter, a former law professor, has offered a master class in consumer protection, corporate accountability, and anti-corruption reforms. We have a whiteboard waiting, just in case you want to use it. In her new book, I Swear Politics is Messier Than My Minivan, Representative Porter shares what it's like to really serve in Congress, and she exposes the gaps between politicians' press conferences and real people's lives. She does, in fact, have a minivan, and the license plate reads, Oversight. Hilarious. Looking, for, looking ahead, Congresswoman is running for the Senate seat that Dianne Feinstein has held for three decades. Tonight, yes. Tonight, we're also so pleased and honored that Representative Porter will be in conversation with Molly Ball, Time Magazine's national political correspondent and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Pelosi. There are autographed copies for sale tonight. Molly is also a fellow badass mother of three, and we're delighted to have her with us. Later in the program, we would love to hear your questions. You'll be invited to line up at the standing microphones in the aisle, and following the event, we'll have a book signing. Thank you all again, both here and at home, for being with us tonight. And please help give me Congressman Katie, Congresswoman Katie Porter and Molly Ball a warm welcome to Sixth and I. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm so excited to talk to you about this book. It is such an unusual uh, political book, not at all your traditional sort of recitation of talking points. And in addition to being a remarkably unguarded uh, memoir, it's also sort of a, a citizen's guide and a deconstruction of a lot of what goes on in, in Congress. So uh, talk a little bit about why you wanted to write the book and why, and why you took the approach you did. Yeah, when I first started thinking about the book, um, I just got into Congress, and I, like, I couldn't find the bathroom, I couldn't find my office, and people were like, you should write a book. And I was like, what, like a little, like with a little pull-out map? Like, I, I literally did not feel like I had anything to say, and I think that's something that, that plagues um, a lot of people, but particularly people who maybe don't fit 
um, into the mold of those who have come in, in the past in the institution. And so then when I, when I finally felt like I had something to say and was ready to tackle the book, I started looking at examples. And some of them are really, really boring. <laughs> And I think the reason that political memoir can sometimes be that way is because the book is designed to sell you on the image and the talking points that they use every single day. And my book is different. My book is all the stuff that I want to say every single day, but some people don't let me. So the, it's not, though, and I think this has been interesting, it's not a tell-all. It's a book about me. It's not a book really about others, although I obviously interact with a lot of others. But I mean, I read one of the books I read when I was thinking about writing this and working on writing this was John Boehner's book on the house. And on the cover of his book, so just contrast here, is John Boehner in this big leather armchair. He's got his tie and he's holding like a, a snifter of brandy. <laughs> and it's like, uh, where is that House of Representatives? Because that is not where I serve, right? Like, and so I think I, I think I thought about some of the things that were important topics that were tackled in those books, but what my own kind of story would be in relationship to them. Uh, well, and uh, I, there, I do want to start with the tough questions, since so much of this book is about accountability. Uh, I learned from this book that, you know, you and I have a lot in common. We both went to Yale, lived in Las Vegas, proudly drive minivans for our three kids. But I have to call out your choice here. A Sienna, really? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's like what I could find. So I went to buy the minivan. Um, I picked the dealership that was open the latest because I didn't have any time. And I purchased it when my daughter was about one, um, Betsy. And she's now 11, so I've had the same minivan for 10 years. It was used when I bought it. Um, and it's, it's country blue, which is like the worst. Um, I mean, that color was not that cool in the 80s. And it's not aging well. Um, but I, I really just, like, I went to this car dealership, and it was the only place that was open, and this was the only used van they had. And, but I really bought it because we had, before that, a RAV4, and I had my three children sitting across in their car seats, and Betsy was riding in the middle, and I had taken the kids somewhere, and then I had gotten the two older kids 7-Eleven Slurpees, like the little tiny mini ones, and Paul's was green, and he was like, the ice was stuck, he'd sucked the fluid, he was waiting for the ice to melt, and he's like, I need help, and I was like, just wait, because I'm driving them alone. And Paul took the lid off his icy, and green, green ice, like Guantanamo, like green ice just covers Betsy, and she's screaming bloody murder, and she's turning green, and Luke is like, Mom, it's an emergency. It's an actual emergency, and I remember like pulling over and kind of taking Betsy strapped into the car seat and like holding it upside down to shake all the ice off her, and she's just, her skin's green, like, and I was like, this is it. I, I gotta get the minivan. Like, that was the final straw for me. Well, the book is full of stories like that. It's, it's, it's really fun. Uh, but it is, as was mentioned, kind of unbelievable that in the year of our Lord, 2019, you were the first working single mom of young kids ever to serve in Congress. And so much of the book... And live to tell the tale, although barely, the book makes it sound like. Uh, but, and, and a lot of the book is about how, how Congress sort of wasn't made for people like you. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, no, I definitely, when I got there, it was, it was just, I, I mean, I thought the hard part would be campaigning because that's the part that people, they, you know, they thank you for campaigning. They, they say, we're so glad you're running. We know it must be hard. So I think maybe all of that and the fact that I had a really tough campaign, I somehow thought that when I got to Congress, it would be easier. And so when I got to Congress and it was harder than flipping a Republican district, it was harder than winning as a Democrat in Orange County, I was like, oh no, like this is really, what am I doing wrong? And so I describe in the book a, a moment, maybe I was there four or five months and I I was exhausted, and I, you know, I'd run, run around all day and didn't feel very successful. And I said to one of my colleagues, you know, he's just sitting there, he looks great. And he was elected the same year I was. And, and so I, I like, sit down, and I said, I don't, I'm just so tired. And I said, I don't, I don't think I'm doing this right. And he said, oh, you're not. 
And I said, well, you know, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm working hard to raise the money to get reelected, and I'm working really hard on my committees, and I'm prepping for my hearings, and I'm trying to go back to the district and do town halls, and I'm trying to get to know people here and try to keep my kids alive. And he's like, yeah, no, 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 no. Like, here's your job. Your job is to be number 218. Because there are 435 members of the House, and 218 is the vote at which we can pass something. He said, your job is to be number 218, and then to get reelected, so you can continue to be number 218. And he said, and that's why I don't take any meetings after 1 p.m. And meanwhile, I was just thinking about my calendar and, and the invites. And so I decided, like, I was not interested in just being number 218. I was interested in being me. Um, and so I kept working hard at hearings. I kept kind of trying to figure it out. But there really was no template for doing it. I feel very fortunate I was elected in a class in 2018 with so many other people who were new. We had the first, in, um, the first indigenous um, people elected, and Secretary Deb Holland and, and Sharice Davids. We had the first lesbian mom. We had a class of national security women, which is not something that Congress has traditionally had. So I do feel lucky that I came in with a group of people who maybe were a little different and wanted to think about the job differently, but it is a powerful institution and it, you know, I pushed it and it, it pushed back hard. Yeah, well you write a lot about the importance of, of, of representation for people like you and a lot of it is about uh, the class divide in Congress and how many of your colleagues are independently wealthy. The guy from the neighboring congressional district who was literally a Powerball winner. <laughs> uh, and how, but how difficult it is to, to be a member of Congress literally living paycheck to paycheck. What does it mean to have, you write, I ran for Congress to be a voice for minivan drivers and parents who silently lament $20 field trip fees. Uh, is Congress missing that voice without you? There are definitely some people from, from that perspective, but I would say, I think particularly as a Democrat, I really thought that we were the party of regular people, people who, who put the, the blueberries back, in the, back on the shelf when they cost too much, or the $20, you get you know, can I, another $20 field trip fee, or um, you know, can I really, can I get my tax refund before my summer camp bill becomes due? And what I learned when I got to Congress was actually the, the biggest, the, the Republicans, um, in some ways have more members who are sort of regular people, for lack of a better word, and actually the Democrats are just as much or more than the Republicans, the party of kind of the ultra-wealthy and the privileged. And that really surprised me. And so, you know, when I, I thought about this job as public service, but I didn't think about it as like community service. Like I, I actually live on the salary that I get. And that's, by the way, true for almost everybody. Um, but not, that's not true for almost everybody in Congress. And so there are a lot of people who are retired after very successful businesses. Many of them were born into wealth. Uh, many of them were born into political families. And so, you know, early on during the government shutdown, we had a big discussion about whether Congress should refuse its pay because government workers weren't getting paid, which was a terrible and painful thing. And some people said, we should not take our pay because they're not getting theirs. We should be in solidarity. And there's something to be said for that view. Um, and at the same time, others of us, you know, and I was in this camp, said, you know, if you understood really how much that paycheck went, meant to that worker, you wouldn't suggest that we too can just do without it. It's like those of us who really needed to get paid understood the sacrifice that those workers were going through. And, you know, making my kids go hungry because their kids are hungry, just, this is not an additive outcome um, for us. So. I, I do think one of the things that we could do is I think we should ban self-funding by congressional candidates. And so to my great surprise when I ran for Congress, one of the com I knew I had to raise money, but one of the conversations they have with you is how much can you contribute? And I was like, like $100? <laughs> and they were like, no, we were thinking like 100000 And I was like, no, right? And so in my... 2018 race, there were my two neighboring districts. One of them was a Powerball winner. Another one had inherited wealth and had run a big company. And each, each fundraising deadline, they were writing themselves half a million, million-dollar checks over and over and over again. 
Um, and I was actually scrambling to raise the money. And so I think we, we get the system, we get the people that we have, in part because we have the system of campaign finance that we do. So if we're serious about wanting Congress to look like and represent the diversity of American experience, including class, then we need to change the rules so that we can actually have regular people serve. You also talk about... You also talk about, and this is not some, something that is necessarily popular to talk about, but you're good about talking about uh, unpopular things, the need to raise congressional salaries, which look big on paper, but there's so much that you have to pay for out of that. Do you think that would go some way towards solving the problem? Yeah, I mean, Congress members are paid $174,000, and one of the things that we struggle with is that is above the median income in the United States. And so if you think about our median voter, they say, well, that's a lot of money. And it's, it is a lot more than they make. Um, on the other hand, we want people from different walks of life to be able to do this, and we want to attract people from different walks of life. And so we have amazingly talented people in public service in different roles, um, and they don't necessarily want to come in to do this, and when they do, they maybe want to hurry back out to become a highly paid lobbyist. Um, and I hear stories that people who exit Congress, they go from making 174 to 874. And, and that's a huge gap, and I think that's, that's not productive. So I actually think the best way to deal with this is what Congress did several years ago. This is actually a case of, as much as I critique kind of Congress's status quo, I actually think the, the far past status quo had it right. We should just have a cost of living adjustment that probably should be pegged to what we give to seniors on Medicare and Social Security, and we should just get the same cost of living that we're giving to seniors and just adjust that salary. But Congress last adjusted the salary, I think, almost 20 years ago. Um, the other thing is people are always asking me, well, like, you know, where's, um, you know, can we get gold-plated insurance? I have Kaiser. Um, I get it through the congressional, through the small business exchange here in Washington, D.C. Um, I pay for a portion of my health care. Uh, my employer, the government, pays for a portion of my health care. And I think that's an example of a really good system because I have the same health care experiences, both good and bad, that my constituents have. Um, people will say to me, well, you know, they all fly first class. Um, I spent like a good year and a half in seat like 23B. Um, and then I worked my way up to like 12B and then to like 9A. And I mean, it's, it's just where there's a way, an element of this that is important that we stay regular people. But I think the gap is, as my children said, we thought that when you were in Congress, we would be famous. <laughs> and not just them as kids, but they had this idea that we would be somehow, our life would be better because we would be important. And as my older son said, we drive the same crappy, min that was just his words, same crappy minivan. Um, you know, we, we live in the same house. Um, we have less money than we had when our mom was a law professor. And we don't get to see her. And so, like, this is, this was a, from their perspective, this whole enterprise kind of backfired, right? It, and I think, so I think there's this gap that we have in the United States between power, which Congress people certainly have the power to change your lives, to improve them, to solve problems, and wealth, which some Congress members have because they had it when they got there. So one of the things I say in the book is Congress people are rich for the same reason that NBA players are tall. They don't grow in the NBA. They get there because they're tall, and rich people get to Congress because they're rich. And I think that is the, that is the fundamental problem that we need to tackle. Well, and it's very striking in the book uh, it was very striking for me to learn to the extent to which your whole life has been defined by financial hardship, uh, not only in your scholarship, but really going back to your roots, growing up on a farm in Iowa, uh, watching your parents have to go out and get jobs uh, due to the, the farm crisis, losing the farm. Uh, talk a little bit about how that shaped you. Yeah, so I grew up in Iowa um, in the 1980s, and Iowa was the first in the, uh, first in the caucus presidential state, and so, you know, every Yahoo who wanted to be president would, would come through the Lions Club and the Pizza Ranch, and so, you know, it, one of the things you gain growing up in Iowa as a young child is you understand that you're politically important. 
that you have this weighty responsibility of helping to pick the president. And so I remember, you know, knowing that, like, Iowa mattered politically. And then, and so you'd have all these people who wanted to shake your hand and they wanted to give you a sticker and take your picture. And then when the farm crisis happened in the mid 80s and banks were closing, the bank in my small town closed. And I describe that in the, in the book. Um, and, you know, farmers were committing suicide. Um, people were losing not just their farms, but their homes. And the response from Washington, D.C. was nothing, it was silence. And so I talk in the book about, you know, um, you know, one of the presidential candidates that year famously suggested that American farmers needed to g learn how to grow, like, arugula or something like that. It wasn't arugula, but it was something like Belgian that. Belgian endive. Belgian endive, there you go. Um, that the solution, this was actually a presidential candidate told the people in Iowa Michael that they Dukakis. should... Michael Dukakis. And then on the other hand, George Bush, who went on to win, um, appointed as his agriculture secretary like a private equity banker. And, and so it was really that neither party was there for me. Neither party saved my family, my community, our way of life. And I think when we look at what's politically happening in a place like Iowa right now, a lot of it goes back to people needing help and not getting it and then therefore they don't trust government and the only folks that they'll vote for or that they'll believe in are people who want to tear down government because there's a lot of anger that government wasn't there when they needed help. Well, I did a bit of a double take in that part where you described the local bank closing because uh, the farm crisis was caused in part by a Russian embargo and high interest rates. Yep. <laughs> Sounds pretty familiar. Uh, and you also were, were one of the few to sort of sound the alarm before the 2008 crisis based on your research into bankruptcy and foreclosure. So I have to ask, what do you think of the economy right now and where do you think we're headed? I mean, I, th I think the nature of capitalism is that you are going to have a certain amount of boom and bust. And a lot of what government's job is and regulators' job is is to try to, to soften that a little bit. You can't flatten it because um, you actually want us going up. Um, but you're trying to soften the, the lows, and to do that, you have to also soften the highs a little bit. Um, but there are still going to be booms and busts. So, I'll, you know, I was, I'm on this kind of text chain from hell with all the other members of the California delegation, it's, of the Democrats, it's like 37 people, you know. And nobody can even figure out who anybody is, right? So as soon as someone posts something, someone says, is that you, right? So, and after Silicon Valley Bank um, failed, Somebody posted a message and, and, and they said, unbelievable. And I thought, oh, so not unbelievable. <laughs> like, this is literally my third go around. I'm the, like, one of the youngest people on this chain, and this is my third go around of bank failures that I have personally been involved in in some way. So I do think the economy is, I mean, there's, this is good news and bad news. We're, we're not quite sure how to, you know, we're trying to bring down inflation and not crash everything, but the problem is you, you realize you went too far after you did it. And I think that's a little bit of the story with some of the government spending we did during the pandemic. We were very much wanting to get help to people who needed it. And then afterwards, we're like, mm, yikes, like a lot of these, these programs gave out money to people who didn't need it, or how do, we, how do we reallocate that money to those who are still in need? Um, and so I, I think it'll be... I'm hopeful. I feel very confident with President Biden. I feel less confident in Jerome Powell. Um, and so I think it'll, it'll, we'll see. We'll see. But I will tell you, if it's not this year, it'll be next year. If it's not next year, it'll be in five years. And so, you know, I said to someone, you know, I said, banking failures are not unbelievable. They are inevitable. And so they're built into our capitalist economy. And so the job of our bankruptcy system, our policy makers, is to think about how do you soften those, those bottoms? How do you pick people back up and put them back and get them back being productive? How do you help them have that fresh start in life? Well, and you went on to study bankruptcy with Senator Elizabeth Warren, but, I, but actually what I thought was so interesting, I didn't know this, uh, you went to college and did your senior, senior thesis on the opening of a pork plant in a small town in Missouri and you sort of idealistically believed that this corporation might actually be a good thing and save this town. 
Talk about what happened and, and, and was that sort of a turning point in how you saw the role of business in society? Yeah. So I think having been, I have my family, I, I mean, I grew up in the house that my great grandfather built um, and had two bedrooms. I was very fortunate that my parents only had three of us because my grandparents had had six, um, five boys in one bedroom and my aunt who slept on the couch until she was 18. Um, and so I, I had, we were all sort of very small farmers. We were our own independent people. I didn't have any experience with big corporations. There weren't any big employers. And so I think I thought that given how the hardship that we had been through, that corporate America must surely be better. And so when this big corporation came in, um, they bought up a bunch of land. They started raising millions of pigs um, in these consolidated feedlot kind of situations. Um, you know, the workers in that town got a lot of the things that, to me, growing up, had represented kind of an unattainable good life. For example, employer-provided health care, which wasn't something that farmers or my family had had. Um, vacation, like an unheard of thing among farmers, right? Um, a sponsor for their t-ball team, a company picnic, like all of these things that are sort of what it means to be a worker, but what I saw when I began to do my research was sort of the underbelly of that, right? Which was, yes, they get these perks, but there's, there, there's, no, there's no beyond that, right? You're stuck, you're frozen as this hourly worker. There's no pathway, there's no ability to build wealth, there's no ability to become the next owner. Um, and so that corporate pork farm, about a year and a half after I finished my thesis, or two years, it actually filed bankruptcy um, itself and went under and had destroyed what was left of the farming economy in that town and then left it with a huge amount of environmental contamination and no jobs from the corporate park farm. So yes, I would say part of my wanting to go toe to toe with corporations is that I believe that business and capitalism can be a force for good, but you, you have to put some boundaries on that. Um, capitalism makes a lot of assumptions about marketplaces that aren't true. And so the presumption that there's competition and yet a lot of times we don't have any choices. The presumption that there's price transparency and yet when you walk into a doctor's office, we have no, they can't tell you what it's going to cost, right? Um, the presumption that, that you have um, the, you know, the time to shop or the ability to make a choice. So I think we have to put some guardrails on capitalism to make it be successful. And I, I'm willing to push to do that. Clearly. <laughs> And you went on to Harvard Law, where uh, you began uh, studying bankruptcy with then Professor Elizabeth Warren. Talk about that work and how it's informed your perspective. Yeah, my strategy, I took Elizabeth Warren's class my last year of law school, and I had heard that she was a very tough professor. And I was a hardworking student. I, I really liked law school, um, and I, I wanted to, to use the law. I wanted to it seemed powerful, and I wanted to figure out how it worked and how to make it useful. So I had a very clear strategy. I sat right there in the front row, and I thought if I, I sat there and she could see me, and I, I kind of gave a smile that really radiated, I am prepared, so there's no need to call on me. <laughs> and it, it completely failed. Um, and, I, and Elizabeth actually tells this story in her book um, about, her book Persist, about this day that she called on me, and I, you know, I had done the reading, I was very diligent, and I gave, like, I gave a really good answer. I felt, I really gave a great answer. And I finished, and she said, oh, no, come on, Miss Porter, think, think. And I remember feeling the tears well up. I am thinking, right? And, and I went to see her afterwards, and I remember that part of the conversation. Elizabeth remembers what happened afterwards, which is that I went to see her and, and told her, don't give up on me. Like, I know I didn't do a good job today, but please, please don't give up on me. And she didn't, she just kept coming back, and I got better, um, and I, I think I learned a lot from her about not giving up um, on people and on believing in them and kind of coaching them and pushing them to be better. So I would not say it was most joyous class I ever took, but I will say it was the most rewarding class I ever took. And in the course of uh, your research for, for her research on bankruptcy, 
Uh, you discovered that in a lot of cases, the banks weren't following the rules. Talk about that a bit. Yeah. So when I graduated from law school, it was 2001. And so in the beginning and really the early, early to mid-90s and continuing every year, um, the credit card companies, the big banks, lobbied Congress to make the nation's bankruptcy laws stricter. And um, this is a huge lobby. It's the, the Wall Street banks is the biggest lobby in Washington. And it won't surprise you that the people who are bankrupt don't have a lot of money to spend on lobbyists. So this is a pretty one-sided conversation that goes on. And so the debate was really raging about whether or not people in bankruptcy, the debtors, cheated, whether they, whether they failed to disclose assets, whether they really needed help, whether um, we, should be, we should crack down on them because they were sort of gaming the system. And so Elizabeth was doing a lot of research on that, and I was helping her. I was one of her research assistants. And what I decided to do was sort of flip the, flip the lens and say, well, do creditors, do banks follow the rules? And so um, my colleague, Tara Toomey, and I um, gathered like 1,700 bankruptcy court files. And in each one of them, we, we asked, um, did the bank attach a copy of the mortgage? Did they attach a copy of the loan document? Did they explain, itemize how much they're owed? And the rules were very clear. You must do these three things or you cannot get paid. And what we found is in about 40% of the cases, the banks didn't do those things. And, um, and so th that was really, that, that research, as, as luck would have it, that research came out right as the financial crisis was happening. And so when I was doing the research, everyone was saying to me, like I remember this, I described in the story this one banker who I gave my research and I showed my charts and graphs and I explained what I had done. And he said, um, Lady, Wells Fargo doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> and I remember thinking later, well, okay, I believe you. Wells Fargo does not make mistakes. They just intentionally cheat your ass. And so, like, <laughs> I was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt that they were just making mistakes. Um, so I ended up calling that paper misbehavior, which is a nice way for, to say what I said before, misbehavior and mistake in, in mortgage claims. But it, what it really showed was that not only were these loans being made, um, it, without good documentation to people who couldn't pay back on predatory terms, but the cycle of cheating people just continued from that door-to-door -door salesman who sold you the loan, through the financing, through the refinancing, through the foreclosure, through the bankruptcy, and all along, every step along the way, Wall Street was getting rich and families were losing their homes. Um, and so I think it was, it was that research that I think really solidified my commitment to, to being on the side of consumer protection and to helping hold banks to account. I think it was my first big oversight project. <laughs> There's a, such a clear uh, through line, even with Wells Fargo, in fact. Yes, you should yes. tell that story. Yes, so Wells Fargo came to testify before Congress. And I served on the, it was 2019, and I served on the Financial Services Committee at that time. And one of the bankers that I, not the person who said Wells Fargo didn't make mistakes, but one of the bankers that I had um, worked with when I was um, working on California on foreclosure prevention brought the CEO at the time um, to see me. And the idea was that if we sat on our couch, you know, I came in my office, and if he sat on my couch and he was nice to me, then it would all go okay at the hearing. So I was very happy to have him sit on my couch and then I was very happy to take him down the next day. Um, and so um, Kaylee, who's here with us, like how she helped me write those questions. But what we basically, his whole thing was that you can trust Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo, um, you can take them at their word. Um, they really want to do right by you. Rebuilding trust, this was their whole mantra. And I asked him, can we, can we believe this? You've said today that Wells Fargo is is, you know, is companies can count on, consumers can count on you to do right by them. Oh, yes. That's, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, would, we are committed to our consumers. And then we hit them with their, corp, their, their pleadings in a court case in which they had said 
that statements like you can count on us and we will treat you right and we won't cheat you are corporate puffery. And so they literally were, on the one hand, coming to Congress and saying, you can trust us, and on the other hand, we're taking those very same statements and arguing in federal court that these cheated consumers shouldn't be able to get any um, redress because those were just unactionable corporate puffery. And so, needless to say, Mr. Sloan is no longer the CEO of Wells Fargo. And I believe that quote about corporate puffery was, was on the whiteboard. Yes. Uh, so let's fast forward to Congress, and, and the whiteboard has become justifiably famous. Talk about uh, how you came up with that and, and, and why it's been so effective. Well, as a professor, I would often have this experience of um, asking my, you know, I'd call on my students, um, very similar to how Elizabeth Warren did. I, I tried not to make them cry. Um, but I would call on my students because I wanted to know what they thought. I wanted to make sure they were understanding. And so I would have this experience in the classroom where you would, you would ask your question, and then you would say, can you, you know, what do you think? And the student would say, can you repeat the question? and then you'd have to start all over. And there's a lot of that that apparently um, highly paid lobbyists and lawyers coach corporate CEOs to do a, the very same things that unprepared, hungover students do, <laughs> right? So the, you know, all, I used to, people think that they, you know, that teachers love their A students, but it's really my unprepared, hungover students to whom I owe my ability to take down witnesses in Congress. <laughs> um, and so the whiteboard was partially a tool to make sure that they, they couldn't do that. Can you repeat the question? Because I was, I was lining it all out there. And then it was partially, again, for the same reason in a classroom. You're putting things on the whiteboard to make it easier for people to follow along. You're trying to draw, you're trying to get them to wake up, look up from their phone, look at the classroom, engage with the material. And so it was the same thing with the whiteboard. Um, but, you know, the... The whiteboard was not always welcome in Congress. Um, I got gaveled down by the chair people sometimes, and at one point it was called a dynamic visual display. And I was like, dude, it's just a, it's just a whiteboard, right? Um, so, you know, I would say that I, I have gravitated to committees and to chair people who really are there for the whiteboard. I will say the book pulls no punches. Not only does she name names, she includes the pictures of the whiteboards she was not allowed to bring to committee. So you can get it all in the but book. Sometimes I will say, like today, I, I kind of wanted to carry a whiteboard into the hearing just to mess with the witness. <laughs> like I had nothing to put on it. It, it wasn't like a, the kind of a hearing that lent itself to a whiteboard, but I just kind of wanted to watch the Republicans freak out and watch the witness start sweating. And so, but I, I behaved, I did not. Well, there's a serious issue here though, right? I mean, it's fun to sit here and, and, and cackle about some villainous CEO getting taken down, but I think there really is a feeling in this country that, you know, whether it's 2008 or, or Donald Trump, that powerful people get away with things and there isn't any way of holding them accountable. Do you think we have a crisis of accountability in our country? Yes, 100%. And I think that is something, by the way, that Democrats need to be more honest about. Um, often when we talk about this accountability thing, people say, well, oh yes, the Republicans, right? Or, and, and so the truth is, it's a culture of Washington, it's a culture of Congress. Um, oversight is one of the constitutional duties of Congress. The power to check the executive branch is with us. And so that means that the, the duty to do oversight doesn't change when your party's president is in office. I think there are fewer oversight opportunities with President Biden. And I think the, you know, the cabinet secretaries are like literate. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a very different experience. Um, I mean, you know, when I questioned the secretary of HUD, Ben Carson, and I was asking him about REOs, and what we can do about foreclosures, and he thought I was talking about chocolate sandwich cookies. I mean, I don't have as many of those moments with President Biden's um, administration, but it's still important. And I'll, I'll give you an example from yesterday. Um, the New York Times reporting on um, unaccompanied children who are coming to this country and getting placed 
um, into sponsors and then winding up in incredibly dangerous and abusive and exploitation, exploitative um, factories, um, meatpacking plants, and other places. That has happened. That happened under the Trump administration. That is also happening under the Biden administration. And we, we can't just look away from that harm, from what's happening to those kids, because it's happening on Democrats' watch. Being a Democrat, to me, means being willing to dig in and try to do better. That's what it means to be a progressive, to make progress. And we clearly have progress to be made on that. Um, but there is a lot of pressure in Washington to, to give your party the pass and then lob everything, whether it's deserved or not, at the other party. What about the Justice Department? Do you think they should take a tougher stance? Yes, I mean, look, the hearing we had yesterday had one witness, and it was a woman from the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is part of HHS, and that completely misses out on the fact that we had whistleblowers who, who raised alarms about this, who were ignored, so I would like to hear from the Inspector General at HHS about why these complaints and whistleblower um, actions weren't taken seriously. I would like to hear from the Department of Labor that is in charge of enforcing our labor laws that prohibit children from working in these kinds of jobs. I wanted to hear from the CEOs who are employing nine and 10 year olds in dangerous jobs who say, how could we, how could we have known? Right, And so I, I thought the hearing was a... Uh, I actually salute the Republicans for having the hearing, but they were so willing to hold the Biden official accountable and not willing to hold the entire chain of people who are hurting these children. So I, I think my point yesterday wasn't that we give a pass to, to this witness. We have to ask her tough questions, but then we, we also have... I also have questions for the CEOs of these corporations that are hiring these children and then trying to say... How was I supposed to know? And I, I mean, I literally hear this from my children all the time. <laughs> Paul, you, the lint filter, like that dryer just is like gonna catch on fire. How was I supposed to know? <laughs> well, Paul, because I've showed you yesterday. I mean, like, like I think as parents, we all have a lot of those experiences. And so um, I do think there's a, a, a need for Democrats to understand that if we want to earn the American people's trust, which to me is, is really the, the most important part about democracy, is it only works if people trust their representatives, if people trust their government. If we want to earn people's trust, we have to be willing to be honest and fair and tough about where our own party falls short, as well as opposing dangerous policies of the other party. You can't just do the one and not do the other if you really want to rebuild trust in government. Well, the other part of getting people to, to trust the government and um, it, it is, is just to understand it, right? And, and you write in the book, as I see it, the real work of Congress is civic education. It's always remarkable to me how many people in Washington really don't see that as part of their job, just explaining things to people and helping them understand what's going on, particularly when it's you know, 3,000 miles away. Talk about that sort of function and how you've embraced it. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a sometimes... Um an effort to make it all seem complicated. It's, you know, this, this is a really complicated area of policy and, the, you know, the, the constitution, constitutional complexities of this. And, and the, the sort of vibe from that is, trust me, you don't need to worry, I, I've got gotcha. you. And I, I think in a democracy, that is the wrong approach. So I try to think about trying to start in a place where I think most people are. That means not using acronyms, trying to avoid buzz phrases that, that mean literally nothing. I mean, I talk in the book about one of my favorite, least favorite buzz phrases, which is comprehensive immigration reform. Trump's wall was comprehensive. Those, those cages that those kids were in were comprehensive cages. Um, but at the same time, Democrats keep saying, we're for comprehensive immigration reform. The Republicans say they're for comprehensive immigration reform, and the American people think that we're all full of shit. And so I, I think it's really important to try to use language and to start at the beginning, um, to invite people in. And so I think a lot of that... Um, unwillingness to kind of teach and to bring people into it. It's, it's not just a lack of focus. It's an intentional strategy to keep power in the hands of a handful of folks in Washington, including lobbyists, and to keep power and outrage and political will out of the hands of the American people. And I, I think that's 
backwards in a democracy. Well, and you talk so much in the book about uh, your impatience with these sorts of, of platitudes and, and pretentiousness, and, and, it, and it's what makes the book uh, so refreshing. I thought it was interesting that you, you actually talk about having, uh, having run for Congress in the traditional way, sticking to the talking points, and then COVID hit and you decided, if these were my last days on earth, I was going to spend them speaking honestly. We always hear from people that they want authenticity from, from their politicians, but we don't seem to get very much of it. Uh, it seems to have worked for you, though. So why is that? Well, I, I mean, I do think, first off, there is an entire industry that exists to sell politicians on what to say and, and how to look, um, down to, you know, that you need to buy a jean jacket and wear it in your ads and, you know, hold a cup of coffee and, and pat some seniors on the back. We've all seen these, like, very kind of tired political um, ads. So there's a, there's a big industry that specializes in this, um, and they make a lot of money producing ads that look an awful lot like the ads of the other guy. Um, and then I think the other um, reason that, you know, people don't kind of connect authentically is it's a, it's a kind of a vicious cycle. Congress knows, even if we don't admit it, we know that we're not popular. And we are all people who, to get to Congress, literally won a popularity contest. So I want you to think about this. Like, you literally were elected because at least 51% of people thought you were better than the other guy. And then you get to Congress, and the American people's opinion of us is pretty low. And so I think there's a, a fear that if we're honest with the American people about democracy, if we're honest with them about the challenges of the job, if we're honest with them about why some things aren't going to get solved, that, that the people won't respect us. And I think, you know, this is changing generationally, but I, I think people would prefer the straight answer. And so people asked me recently, you know, why, why won't Congress pass gun violence prevention? And the, the, the correct talking point, if you're a Democrat, is to talk about the NRA, to talk about the gun lobby, um, to talk about the need to elect, re-elect me, the next, right, this is, this is the sort of standard thing. And those things are true, but the, the real truth of why we haven't passed gun violence prevention in this country is that the majority of representatives don't support it. That's a hard, hard thing to sit with, right? And because it means that it's, it's back onto all of us as voters to win more races, to elect people who share our values, to put more pressure um, on our elected officials. And so I, I think it's important to to be honest with people about what Congress does, what parts of Congress work differently than people's expectations. Um, and I, I think sometimes that makes Congress look better than people think it does, and I think sometimes that probably makes Congress look even worse than people think. But my all-time favorite poll is there was a poll done asking people um, about things that they don't like. And so it was like, um, you know, how, how do you feel about things like, you know, thunderstorms? How do you feel about, um, you know, snakes? How do you feel about cockroaches? How do you feel about Congress? And the cockroach beat Congress. <laughs> and every time I, t I say this, you know, my colleagues will say, well, well, that's because Republicans are unlovable. And so some of them are. But, but I think that kind of mistakes that it's actually a larger institutional structural problem that we need to think about in our democracy. It's, it's not just that, that, Republican, that cockroach beats Republican Congress people. It's, it's actually all of us, and it's an institutional challenge. Um, we're going to get to your questions in just a minute, so please think of some brilliant ones. I'm going to give you a couple of ground rules. We're going to go a little bit over time here. I feel like you guys are up for it. Uh, but... Please, if you have a question, you can line up at one of these two microphones right here, and I will call on you. Uh, but I do ask you to keep your questions brief, one question per person, and please no soliloquies. If you have a comment instead of a question, uh, please uh, sit down and send her an email later. Um, but uh, before we get to that, you are running for Senate to replace uh, Dianne Feinstein. And... Um, she's been... She's been sidelined by illness for, for several weeks now. There have been questions for a long time about her capabilities. Um, 
And, you know, not only is this creating problems for Democrats uh, confirming, confirming judges through the Judiciary Committee, we learned today it may also prevent them from investigating these recent scandals involving Clarence Thomas. Should she step down? I think that's a decision for Senator Feinstein to make. I think, you know, she was elected by the people of California. Um, she was 84. I think when she 85 when she was elected um, and so you know sh sure enough when you elect someone who's 85 Guess how old they are four years later like 89 and I, I feel really badly for her She has shingles um, or is recovering from shingles. It's incredibly painful um, And so I think that's up to her to figure out I do think institutionally the Senate needs to have a system to deal with what seems like inevitable absences people are going to give birth like Rarely, but once in a while, we've elected a woman, right, Tammy Duckworth. Um, people are going to need treatment for, for medical problems. Think about John Fetterman and, and how great it is that he was able to take time to get better and go back to fighting for us. So I, I think the bigger problem here is to have a system, to have an institution that doesn't have any of the normal kinds of flexibilities to adapt to the fact that we are ultimately human beings. So I obviously think it's time for a change. I'm running for the seat I announced early um, because I think California needs a change and I'm, I'm ready to be that um, person and excited about earning the support of Californians. But I, th I think, you know, this in this particular moment as she's ill and trying to navigate, we, we have to just let her do that and have respect for her. And, and Senator Feinstein was a trailblazer and the path that she made um, didn't just get her to the Senate, it created opportunity for so many of us and, and women in politics, including me. So I, I wish her a speedy recovery, and I also wish the Senate some institutional mojo here to figure out how to function, um, because they are going to have people who, who get ill and are not able to serve temporarily, periodically. Well, I cannot believe that nobody in this crowd has any questions. If you have them, please come line up. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a question from our virtual audience. Hello out there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is from... Uh, Helen in Potomac, Maryland, is sort of along the lines of what we were talking about. Other than representing the whole state, in what ways do you feel you can be more effective as a senator rather than representing a district? And how would you do that? Yeah. So I think there are, are two things that immediately pop to mind. Senators serve on about twice as many committees, um, and they have more opportunities to affect more different issues. And so if you, for me, this means like twice the white warning. Right? Um, and so there are a lot of areas where I think we could use a lot more oversight. For example, our military budget. Um, we need to make sure our service members and men and women have what they need and that we're, that we're providing for national security. But I think we all know and we all saw last year that the defense industry lards this budget up. Um, and so I think being in the Senate, I would have twice as many issues and opportunities and committees to work on, and that would give me a chance to, to do work on issues like tax, to do wish, work on issues like farm subsidies, to do work on issues um, like the defense budget. The second reason I think it's important and what I think I would bring to this opportunity is that, you know, I, I won in Orange County and I flipped a seat and I hung on three times and, and watched some colleagues lose each cycle who came in with me and flipped seats. And I think we need in California to have a senator who knows how to win tough races because the goal is, is, is not to, it's not for me to win my election. It is for people who share our values to have a durable governing majority. And so to do that, To do that, I think the Democratic Party needs to, to kind of um, meet that challenge. We need to be stronger talking about the economy. We are the party that delivers a strong, stable, globally competitive um, economy and good jobs, wage growth. So we need to be talking about the economy. Um, I think we need people who, I think California needs a leader who knows how to win in every part and pocket of California and someone that, from California who can go on the road and help us win in places like Montana and Ohio in those toughest races. And so I think that's something that, uh, you know, I uniquely kind of bring to this race. I think for a long time, California, um, we, we cause more problems than we do help for folks in tough races. And I think we need to flip that on its head. And we need our folks who are in democratic states to be really at the front of doing the political work that makes it possible for everyone to get elected in tough races. All right, I have no choice but to call on the woman in the Katie Porter's whiteboard energy tank top. Please, uh, <laughs> go ahead. 
from Crooked Media, if anybody wants to buy one. Um, Senator, or, oh, Senator Porter, I was like, <laughs> Representative Porter, uh, thank you so much for being here. My question is about housing and the rising cost of rent and the rising cost of living, particularly as millennials, Gen Zers, it's a topic that's always on our minds, but it's not talked about in the national news. And so I'm wondering if you have any policies you'd like to see or if there are any municipalities or cities that have em like embraced policies to help with the rising cost of living. So not only did I not pay her to wear that tank top, oh, yeah, yeah. I did not pay her to ask that question. But I think my communications director who is here would tell you, that is literally my favorite topic. <laughs> um, housing is the number one challenge facing most Americans. And yet, as I said to someone, what, what do you think about the democratic platform on housing? The what? Right. <laughs> we don't even have one. And yet when you talk to people, it's housing that determines whether you live in a safe community. It's housing that determines largely the educational opportunity that your children will have. It's housing that determines to some degree whether you breathe clean air and have access to clean water. And so there's, there's nothing that sort of more fundamentally allows a household and a family and people to flourish than having secure housing. And the federal government for about 50 years has just punted on housing and federal officials are quick to blame state officials and state officials blame county officials and county officials blame local officials. This needs to stop. What it means to be a leader in the federal government and the U.S. Senate is to take on the biggest challenges and problems that people are facing. And for our country, that is the cost of housing. So I think the first thing is just to literally talk about it all the time. Congress doesn't even have a housing committee. It gets relegated to a subcommittee within a committee on banking, which financial services, which tells you how we think about it, right? That we're thinking only or mostly about single family homes and people who can save up and buy them, and we're not thinking about the realities of housing for so many people. Um, so there are a lot of policies the federal government could do. Um, one of them is to fully invest in our Section 8 housing program. Um, right now, what we basically, you know, if you think about um, um, Medicaid and say we have three people who need Medicaid, um, who need government provided health care, we wouldn't say to two of them, you two, don't, you two lost the lottery this year, no health care for you but you, you, you get health care. Yet that's what we do with Section 8 housing. We literally have a, a, a random lottery system, a waiting system. We have people waiting 10 and 20 years to get help with housing. Um, I think the other thing we can do is be more creative about housing at the federal level. We're really stuck between the 20% the down, 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which was invented about 100 years ago, and the one-year lease the one-year rental with no protection, no price guarantee, no ability to stay put. Um, and there are models in between that that the federal government could backstop. Um, and then I think part of this is not just Congress talking about this, but getting the executive to reorganize itself a little bit here. I say this in the book, but I mean, HUD rhymes with thud. <laughs> I mean, if, have any of you have seen Designated Survivor? That Keith, I mean, the whole plot of the show is that the HUD secretary won't be able to keep America functioning as a country um, if all the other cabinet members are, are killed. So I think we have talented people who are our HUD secretaries, but HUD is not set up in such a way that it can really succeed. So the housing buck gets passed federal, state, county, local, and then it also gets passed from HUD to Treasury, to the CFPB, to FHFA, to Fannie Mae, to Freddie Mac, to the OCC. I mean, it's an alphabet soup of, of kind of deflection. And so I think rethinking and kind of thinking about housing as a, a core building block of well-being, um, which is, by the way, how our competitor nations think about it. So a lot more can be done. Thank you for asking about it. I asked a group of Davis students the other day, um, how many of them thought they'd be able to buy a house in their lifetime? There were about 70 people in the room. Um, they all had to have basically a 4.0 or higher to get into UC Davis. So these are very bright, amazing graduate and undergraduate students, and not one hand went up. Now, whether some of them are pessimistic, maybe some of them will be able to buy homes. If we as Democrats are not addressing housing, we will not win the votes of the next generation of voters. 
Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Over here. Um, you touched upon this indirectly, but what is wrong with the Democratic Party where they can't get a message across to the public in a succinct, clear fashion that's in a layperson term, like terms rather, like you do with your whiteboard. You lay it all out there, but it's very simple to understand, etc. We have so many things that have occurred throughout, especially the, <laughs> the last administration and the, this current um, Republican controlled uh, uh, House of Representatives uh, Congress, to be out there in the public to have messaging that means something to the people, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or yep. haven't decided yet, but our messaging, we don't have a decent method to message what we stand for in a decent way. And yep. who's responsible for this? Is there somebody within oh. the DNC who's responsible? I've looked Thank all over you. the place. Thank I've been trying yeah, yeah. to figure yeah, that yeah. out. So let me, let me take that in a couple parts. Um, I, I think you, first I want to say this, just be very clear, uh, the Republicans do not have good messaging either. I mean, I saw Marjorie Taylor Greene in the hallway today and she, she screamed at me. She, she got silenced in a hearing. I mean, they, they have their own, I mean, I know it feels like our message sucks, but trust me, I'm in the room and I hear their messaging and it is not good. So I do think both parties struggle with this, but I think they struggle with it and succeed when they do for the exact reason you identified. The winning message is not about Democrats and Republicans. The winning message is about government and the people that it serves. So that, I think, is what we have to orient ourselves on. And so every week we get messaging guidance and the first words of the messaging guidance are always House Democrats are blah, 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 comma, but House Republicans are blah, blah, blah. Nobody should say that. That is a, whatever the blah, blah, blah is, you're losing. The real message ought to be Americans want blah, blah. I am fighting for blah, blah. That, that's it. And so most of us do not get up in the morning and say to ourselves, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher, I'm, you know, um, I'm late to work, I'm a natural blonde, whatever it is, I'm a Democrat. Most of us don't identify that way. And so constantly back and forth about the party, rather than, people can fill in that if you're campaigning for A, the other guy's for B. Right? We don't get anywhere by saying that. And so I think that's one of the problems. And then the last thing you said was, who's in charge of this? Which is a question I get asked all the time. Um, so there are various entities who are supposed to be working on this, but one of the problems with them is that they are very much in the control of and owned by the democratic establishment. And so guess what they want to talk about? Democrats. And so... That, I think, continues to lead to this. And then I also think, frankly, we don't have enough, we have too many people who are in safe seats who can say whatever they want, and a handful of us who are out there knocking on doors and persuading voters and have really had to figure out how to message in a way that brings people in to our party. So when you can persuade voters in Huntington Beach, you can basically do it anywhere. Um, and so, you know, we've had this experience in caucuses where we're given messaging guidance. Say, for example, um, and a, the decision to have an abortion. Because a decision is, is a weighty, consequential thing. Don't say um, a, no, the choice to have an abortion. Choice is like chocolate vanilla. Abortion is like something that you really think about. So we were told this, this is great, great messaging guidance that we were given. And I walk out of the meeting, we were given it on a little index card. I walk out of the meeting, and a reporter sticks the microphone in the, in the face of one of my colleagues and says, what did you talk about? And they said, we talked about being pro-choice. And I was just like, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, it's being pro-choice and being pro-life. I mean, just literally like the opposite of what we were just told. So um, I do think though the fundamental message is our message needs to be about people and what they want from government and about 
what government can and must be doing and is doing to make life better. It can't fundamentally be about one party or the other. And by the way, you can take that approach and never compromise your values. It's, it's not about being in, the, in kind of softening your position. It's about connecting your position with people in a way that is meaningful in their lives. Got time for just a few more. Go ahead. I want to start off by saying I'm a huge fan. I'm a young woman from California in politics, but hearing, about you, hearing you talk about transparency made me want to ask a tougher question. So we've heard tonight about how we can't rely on corporate America to save blue-collar towns, how bank failure is natural and should be expected, how finance is cheating us, and yet the only people you've said should get paid more is Congress. That feels really contradictory to me, to be honest. Um, can you talk about what you're doing to improve the working class experience in America mm -hmm. and what the middle class should rely on as kind of signs of hope in this changing economy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So first, I did not actually say that Congress should get paid more. I said that we should think about making sure that we can have people from all walks of Congress come and do this job. And I talked about ways to do that that are actually consistent with the experiences of working Americans, which are sort of cost of living adjustments. But look, I mean, part of this, I think, is that the piece about the, ex we talk about a lot about the wage side, and that is a big part of it. And for me, that means supporting every worker's right to unionize. I think that having union power um, and having workers' ability to come together and bargain is another example of a check on capitalism. I talked about competition and price transparency. I would say collective bargaining is also an important check on capitalism that we should support. Um, I think we also need to think about not just the income side, but the expense side. So we are, you know, I watch unions, I watch people, you know, fight to get an extra dollar to get to that $14, $15 minimum wage, and literally a big chunk of that wage immediately gets eroded by the rising cost of pharmaceuticals, by the rising cost of housing, by the rising cost of, of um, food. So I think we, one of the things we need to do is just to actually focus on both sides of that. How do we help people actually be able to afford things? And I think the solution to that problem is to treat more things like what they actually are, which is public goods. So for example, why do we invest in childcare? Childcare is not actually about kids, helping kids. It's not even about helping parents as much as sometimes I would love a little help. Childcare is about our future workforce. Childcare is about our present workforce. And so when we turn childcare into something that we all collectively commit to doing, like we think about roads and bridges, then that takes that off people's individual plates. And I think lets workers stretch their dollars toward what they need to be doing, which is making their own decisions about buying a house, you know, paying for food, saving for retirement, planning for their future, um, and doing that. So I, I think your question is exactly right. I think these are the conversations the Democratic Party needs to be having a lot more of. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, one from each microphone. All right, go ahead, sir. Um, so I spend a lot of my time working to get moms like yourself elected to Congress. I think their experience is invaluable in wrangling a lot of the children that pretend to be Congress people. Um, <laughs> what do you think we can do to incentivize more moms to want to run for Congress? Because in the work I do, a lot of moms just don't want to. They can, as you say, the, something's burning in the oven, they're late to something, the minivan needs help, and they don't have, there's no time for bullshit. So yeah. what can those people do to get to want to run for Congress, and also what can we do to get more people willing to throw on a, a no BS hat and knock on doors for those moms? Yeah, um, so this is a terrific question. Look, I think one of the things um, is tackling some of the misogyny in politics, which is unfortunately exists in politics just like it exists in a lot of other spheres of public life. Um, I think for women who are also moms, um, I think one of the things I talk a little bit about in the book is this kind of assumption that, that I myself buy into and, and have to kind of check that, that by running for office, I have, my kids are suffering, that this is something that they're enduring, that this is a choice that I've made to lift up this political endeavor at the expense of being a good mom. And the truth is, my kids are gonna turn out just fine. Um, and part of, they have gotten a lot out of this. They have learned a lot of life skills. They have learned a lot about different issues. Um, they have a mom who is, is pushing them to understand what they need to do as future citizens and their responsibilities. Um, they're my toughest, best constituents um, are my kids. And so 
I think kind of turning on its head this idea that are you, you know, are you willing to have your kids endure this, but rather get them to understand that like most working moms, whether you're a doctor or you're a firefighter, whatever you do as a mom, you are also showing, or a dad, you're showing your kids um, that, it's, that you're part of the economy, that you're part of society, that you're part of um, the building blocks of our country. Um, with regard to knocking on doors, I think the hardest part is simply getting people to knock once. The vast majority of people who knock doors are shocked that it's actually really interesting and really fun and really rewarding. Um, but I have a lot of folks who say to me, you know, I, I'll do anything but knock. And so I think one of the things we need to do, and this requires some volunteer capacity, is pair people up. And it's hard to stretch a campaign to do this, but pair people up. So I love going out with people who've never knocked before, um, and they see for themselves that it's, that it's not that hard. Um, and that, you know, I mean, I'm raising three teenagers right now, so, like, what's the worst they're gonna do? Slam the door in my face? That already happened to me today. You know, um, and my odds are lower with constituents than they are with my teenagers probably. So I think it's, it's actually thinking about how can we get people started on the door knocking. A lot of people will write postcards. A lot of people will send text. I find political texting terrifying. I mean, some of the things people send back to you, I mean, I take my chances at the doors. Plus, I mean, look, you get tan, you get fit. I mean, it's a, it's a good time. All right, last question, and with uh, appreciation for your excellent sweatshirt as well. Yes, I got the sweatshirt for I couldn't pull off the tank top. But um, <laughs> what I will say is, first of all, thank you. I'm just in awe. Um, you know, I'm just a recent college grad. I'm a nobody intern right now in Congress. But moving you forward... You actually... I, the, he's actually in charge of Congress. No, oh yes, this, this, <laughs> the, the interns secret, really just, are. Just between us, yes. No, 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 but uh, in all seriousness, you know, moving forward, I'd love to work on regulation, particularly, you know, financial regulation, because... I'm inspired by, you know, women like you, women like Elizabeth Warren, who have worked on, you know, Consumer Financial Protection Agency, um, even acts like Dodd-Frank. And then, on the other hand, you know, I read an interview that, you know, Barney Frank gives the New Yorker as he's serving on the board of, of the very banks that he once, you know, was the champion of, of cracking down on. And I wonder, you know, there are a lot of people my age who are looking to go into Congress and into political, not even Congress, but just political research, and they say, like, what's the point? Because people go in, and there's this revolving door. So I guess you are so brilliant on both regulation, uh, bank regulation, and oversight. So, A, how would you deal with oversight to overcome some, uh, the lack of limits on current and members of Congress when they become former members of Congress? And also, uh, are there moves to undo some of the regulations uh, that you know, Trump undid revoking some of Dodd-Frank, or yeah. can we extend the protections that those medium-sized banks have to individual um, consumers who aren't anywhere close to $250,000? Yeah. Sorry, I know I'm rambling. I just, no, no. So, I'm just in awe, so I just... Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you're thinking about this, because I think one of the things that the banks rely on is, and I actually have I've sort of seen this actually witness this, is they literally try to bore you into thinking that banking is either hard or complicated, and therefore you should just go back to paying attention only to the social issues, which you should be paying attention to, by the way, but only to those, so they can go back to just buying the laws that benefit them. I mean, it's an intentional strategy, I think, to try to, to talk people out of campaigning on this. So when I went to run for Congress the first time, my pol then political consultants, now no longer, um, they asked me, what did I want to run on? You know, are you going to run on LGBTQ equality? Are you going to run on environment? Are you going to run on health care? Are you going to run on, um, you know, women's reproductive freedom, on abortion? What kind of, what kind of you know, what's going to be your core thing? And I said, banking. <laughs> and they was like, yeah, that's like not a thing. No one cares about that. Or, you know, I said housing, and they said that's not a thing. No one cares about that. Consumer protection. Yeah, no, that's not a thing anyone cares about. The truth is, nobody likes to get cheated. Republican, Democrat, and young, old, voter, non-voter, nobody likes to get ripped off. So consumer protection is actually, if you've been looking for the bipartisan issue that can get you elected virtually anywhere, consumer protection is it. So I think we need to, to hone in more on that. With regard to banking regulations, look, we have a real problem, and it's not new, although it's 
it functions differently. We have a real problem in, in our country of kind of a boom-bust cycle. We, we put regulation in place after a financial panic or a, a, a recession, and then things get better, and then the big companies, big banks lobby, and then we take it away, and then lo and behold. So part of it is to understand that there are going to be some ups and downs. We should try to prevent them as much as we can, but also part of the job of regulation is to soften them and make it make it less painful. And so a lot of, you know, whether, whether putting back the regulations that Trump undid, if we'd had those regulations, would Silicon Valley Bank have failed? I, I can't say for sure. What I can say for 100% certainty is if we'd had those regulations that Trump took away, Silicon Valley Bank would have, would have failed less dramatically, less painfully, with less consequence, with less harm. And so I think, yes, we should put those regulations back. I've been leading the charge to get it. Um, I recently pitched a bunch of Republicans on this. They all told me that it was so right. We had to do these banking bills. This makes a lot of sense. And then they all called my office and said they didn't want to sponsor a bill with me because I was controversial. <laughs> so well, I'm still note. working on them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Congresswoman, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Representative Porter and to Molly Ball. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you'd like to stay, yes. If you'd like to stay for the book signing.